Oh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, for me, Maarten Verstein, it's a great honor today to present to you our keynote speaker for today, Professor Sir Nigel Chabot. Uh, for those not entirely familiar with the UK system concerning honors, the title Sir is an official title awarded by the Queen to those who have served their country through extraordinary achievements, in this case for services to sciences and engineering. And indeed, the list of activities of Professor Chabot is long and impressive. Um, for this conference, I would like to point uh, to his long-standing and effortless attention for open data, which is also materialized in the Open Data Institute that Nigel Chabot co-founded with Tim Berners-Lee in 2012, and of which he is currently the chairman. I encourage everyone to simply look up Professor Chabot's background on the web. Please, not now, of course. Um, and you will immediately understand why so many of us are excited to listen to what he has to say during this speech. So, uh, Professor Chabot, may I invite you to take over the digital floor, or rather, the camera and the microphone. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, it's great to be, well, with you, even if it's virtually. I was so very much looking forward to being in, uh, in Taipei and Taiwan. Uh, it's a country I... I love and was looking forward to it. Um, but this will uh, be a great opportunity to talk to you all about the things that have excited me over my career um, in and around the web, and also to talk about something that I feel very strongly about, which is this whole issue of uh, trying to build what we can think of as an equitable web. So I'm going to start sharing my screen now, and hopefully you will see the presentation. Okay, so um, a variety of hats. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Oxford, um, and also um, a head of one of the colleges, the constituent colleges in Oxford, uh, Jesus College. And as, uh, as was said, uh, I co-founded the Open Data Institute. So a number of different roles, but they kind of uh, merge in a, uh, in a happy way. I want to start off by just reflecting a little bit about the whole challenge. Um, as, as, as we have evolved, as, as human civilization has evolved, we've often gone from a, one of the revolutionary aspects of our development has been this move from scarcity to abundance. And if we think of the various revolutions that have really marked our uh, historical development, perhaps the agrarian revolution, the development of farming, um, ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt, um, the, hierarchy, the, the wonderful painting on the left there, was a moment when food supplies became secure, they became abundant. What was previously really rather difficult and scarce became much more abundant. Or the printing press that uh, gave us the printed word in huge volume. And more recently, the Industrial Revolution, the uh, extraordinary achievements of manufacturing in the 19th century, and most recently, of course, the, uh, the digital revolution. And on the slide there, you can see the wonderful uh, tweet that uh, Tim Berners-Lee put out in the beginning of the Olympic ceremony in London. This is for everyone, uh, reminding us that the web was for everyone. And uh, of course, the extraordinary thing about this uh, superabundance, this new revolution, is that it has given us extraordinary new resources. Uh, many of those resources based, of course, on the fundamental power of computing. Uh, this is a little bit of an outdated model now. This is the uh, iPhone 6. Um, it's the A8 processor inside that, but it's a lovely animation taking you into the depths of the extraordinary engineering that has brought us to where we are today. Uh, we have to recognize that we owe so much to the electrical engineers who have given us devices of such extraordinary power. Uh, the feature size in this iPhone are on the order of about 15 nanometers. Um, just in the brief number of years uh, which uh, have elapsed since the iPhone 6, a couple, three, four, um, the feature size is down by about a half. Um, I used to be able to say you could fit about 450 of those features within a single red blood cell. Well, now it's about 900 uh, because the latest process of the or more or less recent one, the A12 Bionic, has almost 7 billion transistors. So this extraordinary and well-known log linear graph that shows us the extreme increase in compute power 
has, of course, been one of the extraordinary features of our age. It's an exponential. It's truly transformed our world. Other exponentials, of course, the number of websites themselves. This is just taken from a recent uh, review I saw on Statista's uh, website. Claims something on the order of about 1.7 uh, billion websites. Of course, huge numbers of those are simply uh, parked on uh, domain names. Uh, probably about 200 million of them are thought to be active. But nevertheless, it shows you that extraordinary and relentless increase in the available real estate that defines the subject we study. But of course, equity is about access. The word equity in my title is all about fairness, reasonableness. And whilst we have seen this relentless increase in the number of individuals using the internet, and this is our latest data from the ITU, shows us that at the end of 2019, about 54% of the four of, of, of the world's population uh, were uh, had access to the internet. About 4.1 billion people using the internet still leaves um, 3.6 billion who remain offline, unconnected, often in the least developed countries, where in some of them only two out of ten people are online. And the other issue around equity is that. There's a gender gap. There's a gender gap that's actually getting larger in those least developed countries. So there's a good bit still to, to do, just in terms of access of our capability uh, to the world's population. And often when we are reminded of just how far we've come and we're presented with pictures of ubiquitous use of phones, uh, it's quite interesting that this, phone, this, this picture shows you um, four blokes in the Indian subcontinent with their phones. But again, that gender disparity is, is, is more marked in many developing countries. The other extraordinary thing about increase has been the amazing penetration and shift to mobile technology. And one of the reasons I, I, I showed you the, the mobile phone there, the iPhone 6 example, was just the increase in numbers of subscriptions mobile cellulars, um, for every 100 um, individuals on the planet, there are 108 subscriptions. Uh, active mobile broadband subscriptions, 83 for every 100, which of course reminds us that many people are carrying multiple subscriptions around with them personally from a business point of view. The, um, uh, the, the chip that's driving their iPad or their iPhone or their tablet or their mobile device. This increase, of course, has reminded us of another looming issue of equity. And this is the issue about where all the data of all of these devices accessing the internet using the web is actually going. I want to sort of introduce us here to some work that we have been doing within the, um, uh, my Oxford group on analyzing um, that very question. A little bit of a hidden world really, where does all the data actually go? And my team in Oxford um, uh, featured here, Rubin Bins, Ulrich Lynx, Max Van Cleek and Jun Zhao, the, the four of them and myself and uh, Tim Liebert uh, actually produced a, a working analysis of just how much data concentration there was in the mobile app world. And to give you a sense of that, what we actually did was download over a million apps from the Android Play Store and analyze them statically and dynamically to try and uncover the data flows therein. And this paper, um, Third Party Tracking in the Mobile Ecosystem, was presented at the Web Science Conference in, in 2018 and contains details of our findings. But to give you an idea of that, essentially what we were trying to understand was where the various data destinations for the applications that were available were going. So over a million apps, about 49 app categories. And this gives you a sense, this Sankey diagram, this flow diagram shows you one of those applications, Airbnb, and the kind of data that was flowing off of that application in the context of a number of other apps uh, that were being run, 
course location, your personal details, phone characteristics, phone ID, um, your exact location in some cases, and what the onward progression of data from that app was, and, and for what reason, app functionality, marketing, usage tracking, whatever. And that's just one app. So then the question we set ourselves with the analysis we'd done with the million apps that we'd actually analyzed, what could we actually say about the overall flow of data? And this took us to our, our system, um, the, um, what we call um, X-ray. Now I'm gonna show you basically an animation here um, of of the analytics. So what we're doing here with the data we got, what we can do is simulate a number of apps which were loading up simultaneously. We've got an Adobe Reader, British Airways app, um, number of things being loaded up now, the BBC iPlayer, and we're setting various usage levels. And as you do that, what you're seeing in the um, bottom of the screen there are the various destinations of data from that app set. Also, the geography on the right-hand side is being shown. And this has given a very interesting insight, just the overwhelming flow of data with any average number of apps. And we can begin to look at what the effect of swapping one app for another might be. In a moment, we swap out the Adobe uh, Reader, PDF Reader, for a um, open uh, source product. Uh, and we see WPS Office PDF. Suddenly, your data is going to a very different geography. Now, I want to emphasize that this view of the data ecosystem is one that is hard to come by. It had to be hard won, it had to be harvested. There are many reasons why it can be difficult. Uh, many of the libraries that are being used are being encrypted, but we feel it's an important aspect of understanding where data concentrations are, uh, what the challenges are around the equity and availability of that data across the piece. Now, our, our, our actual work uh, caused a bit of a stir. It was featured on the BBC News Channel, uh, kind of typical headlines, mobile app data sharing is out of control. This was just in 2018 and, and on it goes. But our, our question to ourselves was what could we understand about the dynamics of the data ecosystem and and what would the results of an acquisition of one tracking company be by another in terms of market concentration? Do our regulators even begin to know what this landscape looks like? And of course, this is more material in an age when so much of this data is driving the AI, the advanced machine learning algorithms, which are defining so much of the world in which we now live also. So, brings us on to another element of equity. In a world in which so many of the apps, so many of the developments in our digital world are drawing on data that we're generating, where is the balance of interests? Now, of course, this has become a course celebre in some cases. Um, and Shoshana Zuboff, the uh, Harvard academic, has been writing about this whole concept of surveillance capitalism. The idea that we really do need to be thinking about the extent to which our own personal information is used and analyzed and actually creates a new kind of set of challenges for us to think about. It's a topic that my colleague, uh, Roger Hansen, who uh, co-wrote the book with me, The Digital Ape, and I explored to some extent um, in, 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 in our recent uh, uh, book, trying to understand this balance of interest in this highly hyper-connected world. A world in which, as we know, extraordinary companies with extraordinary uh, services and offers have come to be very dominant players in the data ecosystem, sometimes referred to as dataopolis. So what are we to do in the face of some of these challenges? Now, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about my own journey into this. And um, as was alluded to, um, it led ultimately to work in open data. And it's one of the reasons I feel very strongly about this equity issue. So back in the, uh, back in the day, uh, when AI was going through a 
one of its periodic glaciations, a winter. Um, this is, uh, I began uh, my studies in AI in 1978 at the University of Edinburgh. Back then, um, we used a variety of AI languages. Pop11 was a local variant in Edinburgh. We used Prologue and List. There were relatively few textbooks. And yet there was a very strong belief that AI would, um, would be an extraordinary opportunity to change the face of the way we thought about both our own intelligence, but also building extraordinary um, uh, systems. The, back, the approach back then, of course, was rooted in um, classical or good old fashioned AI. And my early work was very much in that tradition. This is a uh, work that uh, developed, led to the development of an expert system or knowledge-based system to design chemical plants. It would take the uh, process flow diagram on the left and turn it into a three-dimensional layout on the right using constraint-based reasoning and rule-based reasoning. And we were you know, reasonably pleased with the results. It was ultimately acquired by an American uh, petrochemical company uh, and elements of it are still in use today. The challenge in those systems was actually to take human expertise and the expertise of the chemical engineer and turn it into rules, into, into automated um, uh, processing. And the challenge was that whilst you could actually formulate some of the uh, design principles as rules very explicitly, keeping uh, objects a certain distance for safety reasons, or, uh, keeping uh, particular uh, uh, um, health and safety rules observed to keep objects apart for servicing. Other things were just down to common sense. It turns out if, you, if you're a chemical engineer looking at the diagram on the left, there's something very striking about the fact that the common sense the chemical engineer has realizes that to get the fluid from the containers to the reactant tanks, you use gravity because there are no pumps at a particular point in the description of that flow sheet to tell you that you use that. But the common sense engineering approach has you put the tanks higher up to exploit gravity. That tacit engineering knowledge was hard won. It's something that knowledge engineers spent a huge amount of the time doing. And it's the kind of work we did in the 90s trying to formulate both the tools and methodologies for building these complex rule-based systems. And it's interesting to reflect on the fact that a number of people uh, who are now um, work very uh, much in the core of, um, of, of the web came from that tradition. In fact, Yolanda Gill, uh, uh, who was the keynote uh, on the first day of the conference, and I would meet at knowledge acquisition conferences where the whole challenge was turning human expertise into executable uh, machine code. And there were methodologies for doing this, indeed software frameworks to, for doing this. And one of the uh, uh, remarkable things about that time was that as we got into this uh, work, um, we began to realize as the web developed that this was an extraordinary resource for knowledge-based systems. We almost came to think of the web as an extraordinary opportunity for an extended database. And two of my uh, um, most remarkable PhD students, uh, Louise Crow and Jenny Tennyson, were both working um, in the late 90s on systems that tried to use the web as an exploitable resource for building knowledge-based systems. When I moved to Southampton um, in um, 2000, um, joined by Nick Jennings, uh, known for his work in agent-based reasoning, um, and there's Dave DeRaw there in that photograph, but in the middle there's Jim Hendler. Jim Hendler was at the University of Maryland at the time, and Wendy Hall on the right there. Um, Jim Hendler had just been co-author with um, Tim Berners-Lee and Aura Lassler on the uh, semantic web um, paper that appeared in Scientific America. And this whole notion, that you could take some of the basic precepts of knowledge representation and deploy them at scale on the web. And indeed, the famous semantic web layer cake was a proposal to build a set of standards that would allow you to structure knowledge and link data at web scale. In fact, it had really bold ambitions, not just to um, link and represent conceptual schemas or ontologies, uh, but indeed to, to run uh, logic or proofs across the content on the web. And at the time I arrived at Southampton, we were engaged in some very 
Um, interesting engineering work to not really go as high and as far as description logics to reason over the content, but certainly we used ontologies a lot. We used the structured vocabularies of a domain to organize and manage content. And this was the so-called um, the Advanced uh, Knowledge Technologies Project, which was a UK funded project with a number of universities where we were bringing together um, really uh, very interesting developments in the field at the time. In fact, the team at Southampton built one of the first graph engines using um, the triple stores uh, to allow us to do the experimentation that allows us to show the opportunity of linking data at web scale. Now, the semantic web didn't exactly exist in 2000. It was a proposal. It didn't exist per se. And what we began to do was to show uh, examples of what it might look like if it were to be engineered. And one of our um, uh, leading examples of that was the um, CS Active system. Um, Tim and uh, Wendy and I had been thinking about the whole proposal around the semantic web and what its key elements were. And a revisited the whole notion of how much essentially you required and this fundamental set of ideas around dereferenceable URIs uh, were, were a key feature of that. So networks of URIs that allowed you to link concepts and values together at web scale. And the manifestation of that was our um, uh, CS Active. This was actually a system which attempted to take the uh, computer science um, um, community in the UK and pull together a whole set of um, descriptors and information about the, 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 the community. So here we uh, visualized it. Essentially, we would take data from websites, uh, publication lists across the country, um, enumerations of people we knew had projects from the research councils. And we integrated this into a large triple store and tried to show how the integration of these knowledge assets via an ontology would give you the beginnings of a connected semantic web. This idea, um, which won the International Semantic Web Challenge back in 2003, um, was in fact a very nice illustration of the art of linking information together using semantic web standards. And here we can see that as we track through and we focus on various objects in the world of computer science in the UK back in the 2003 or so, we can see it analyzing and presenting information around my community of practice, um, the publications, the projects I was involved with, and moving from those linkages onto other uh, peers I was working with in the community, all of which was back-ended by a triple store which allowed us to represent information in terms of the underlying RDF formats. Now that kind of approach, um, interestingly enough, caught the interest of the UK government. And in 2005 and six, we were asked to show whether these methods could begin to serve as a way of integrating uh, data from local government and national government. And these are some of the agencies we were working with back then. And we made real progress, except that we kept hitting the brick wall that the data was not easily available. The data was not openly available. It was often under license. It was difficult to access. It was not in a form that was very uh, amenable to machine processing. And despite the best efforts, we realized that we could only ever show simple proofs of concept. And there it might have stayed, uh, except in about 2009, a number of governments around the world would be getting, getting interested in the whole notion of open data, of opening the data that governments collected for more general use. And Tim and I, Tim Berners-Lee and I, were asked by the UK government, by the Prime Minister of the time, Gordon Brown, to help accelerate that process. Um, and we had a huge amount, I have to say uh, straight out, fun and uh, purpose in doing that. We set up the data.gov.uk site. There were um, similar efforts around the world. And we rapidly found ourselves releasing data 
of all sorts of types. And one has to remember in many of these efforts how far we have come in the, in the decades since then. Um, back in uh, 2009, uh, we actually produced a fiction uh, paper, a newspaper, printed version of a thing we call the postcode newspaper. And this was a representation of all the sorts of data that might attach to a postcode, a local area of geography in a part of the UK, postcodes like a zip code. And that might have to do with everything from the recycling rates to the crime rates, to how well the schools were doing, to when the buses ran, all the public data that could be um, found in national and local government agencies. We produced this, and actually we produced it against all the licensing rules of the time because everything we reproduced at that point was not available as open data. So we basically broke the copyright rules as they then existed. But it demonstrated that if we could just get the data released, we'd have an extraordinary set of resources. And through time, we've been able to demonstrate those benefits. And back to the question of equity, the power of open data is as much around the political effects it has, the effects around transparency and accountability, the economic effects it has around efficiency and innovation and growth, the fact it has a social impact, it can promote inclusion, help promote diversity, identify issues around poverty and disenfranchisement. And as we go through these attributes of the open data, um, exercise and philosophy and methodology. The great thing about those features is that they work for different governments at different times in different ways. And those data releases came thick and fast from uh, crime data in the UK through to uh, data around prescribing. This is data about the GP uh, uh, prescriptions that are written out every month in the UK for all sorts of conditions and situations. Um, data about the environment, data about transport. And here we're beginning to see with the transport data, this is the um, city mapper example, which is now widely deployed in many capital cities, that we also begin to see the evolution of APIs into that data, application programming interfaces. And those standard APIs, so here this is the API that is uh, produced by Transport for London, which is the uh, transportation authority for all of London, gave huge power to developers and innovators to develop new types of application. And this is something that became very powerful very quickly. Here's another example from Open Corporates, an independent company which tries to put together information about the um, limited companies in the United Kingdom and around the world. Our vision was always that this could and might be done using semantic web standards, URIs, in fact. Um, but in truth, uh, what we were really struggling to uh, try and persuade people to do was to think that this is an investment in a new kind of infrastructure. In fact, data as infrastructure was very much the light motif, the, the message we were pushing and have come to see as centrally important. The Open Data Institute, which was uh, referenced earlier, which Tim and I established in 2012 to try and promote the use of open data as an asset. This is a fundamental tenant of the approach, that data has to be engineered, not simply casually collected in any form that might come, come about, that essentially infrastructures are about being reliable, of high quality. They need to be reproducible and interoperable, maintainable, have appropriate governance around them. And that too often the open data efforts have just hoped the data would take care of itself. Data curation and management and engineering is hard work and it needs real commitment. But of course the, the benefits when you begin to go down that route and do that on, where, on, on data connected on the web at scale are extraordinary. We've begun to see this. In fact, my memory of visiting um, uh, Taipei in Taiwan uh, in uh, 2013 was to 
was to begin to promote joint initiatives uh, between um, the UK and Taiwan. And the extraordinary uh, thing to witness is just how far that has come. Um, it's a journey that is ongoing. But as I saw from the opening ceremony yesterday, you have very real demonstrations of the power of open data right now operating in Taiwan. This is the um, demonstration of the availability of, um, of uh, face masks, which are provided in real time for all the pharmacies, uh, for all members of the population. I thought this was a very nice example of how data released actively and aggressively by a government, by an administration, can really work to everybody's benefit. But this takes effort, it takes commitment, it takes integration, it takes standards, it takes interoperability and quality seriously. And we've also found in this time of the pandemic exactly similar challenges. Um, the Open Data Institute is working to uh, understand how in our own data ecosystem, the data can be improved to help support us through the pandemic. And we've been joined in that, we're delighted to say, by a uh, announcement just on Tuesday. And if you'll bear with me, um, this is not a, uh, a plug for any particular company, but it just so happens that Microsoft have also joined the ODI in this effort. And actually, Brad Smith, their uh, president, says it as well as anybody. Let me share this with you. We're excited at Microsoft to launch a new campaign, an open data campaign, a campaign that we believe addresses one of the critical issues for the world today. Around the world, data is playing a more important role than ever. Humanity is creating more data than ever. In fact, each and every day, humanity creates more data in a single day than we did as a species in our entire history up until the year 2000. And we're doing more with data than ever before, whether it's pursuing great challenges in the fields of science and sustainability or advancing the economy. But if we're not careful, if we don't address the need for open data, we're going to fall into a new and looming data divide. Indeed, that's what the world already is confronting. According to one recent study, over half of the data generated on the internet each day is flowing to only a hundred companies. Think about that, a hundred businesses of the tens of millions of businesses around the world. And if we don't address this, we risk seeing economic generation, economic wealth following the same path. As PwC recently estimated, more than 70% of the economic value from artificial intelligence could flow to only two countries, the United States, and China. All of this shows that we need to democratize artificial intelligence, and to do that, we need to start by opening up data. That's what our open data campaign aims to do. We launched this with an appreciation that many others are involved already as well. People in other companies, people in academia, people in the research field, and we are excited to join their effort to join with a campaign to close the data divide. Our campaign has three pillars. The first is on five principles that we're adopting at Microsoft to ensure that we're sharing data, especially for the issues that are of broad societal impact. In addition, we're committing ourselves to a broad range of new partnerships and collaborations. We'll launch at least 20 new partnerships by the year 2022 in two years to open up and share data in critical fields. Today, we're launching this partnership with the Open Data Institute, a leader in this field. The mission of the Open Data Institute is to find the value in data, whether it's social or economic. We want to work with companies and governments to build an open and trusted data ecosystem. We want to build a world where data works for everyone, for the many, not the few. 
So that rather bizarrely uh, was me recording uh, 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 an insert for the uh, uh, that announcement just a few days uh, previously in this very same room. But it does make the point, I think, rather uh, compellingly that, again, it's around the equity of data and access to data and that as much of that should be as open as possible. And actually, uh, I think there's no finer example of the, of the actual power of open data than, than, of course, the remarkable phenomena that is Google. When Page and Brin gave us the remarkable engineering and the analytics and insight around the uh, PageRank algorithm that gave us the Google search engine, they were actually exploiting and building on one of the most remarkable examples of actually open data. It was the hyperlink markups that were the collective effort of everybody using the web, the ability to look at those linkages and to do the ranking on their relevance and importance as a representation of our interests in the content itself. And I think that's something to bear in mind as we understand how how data shared at scale creates extraordinary externalities. To such an extent that now the challenge is we have huge companies with huge incumbency, and how do we actually make them and their data available in ways that feel equitable to, the, uh, to all of us? And this is where we're beginning to see a variety of responses. We know that regulators are out there looking at the various uh, behaviors of these big platforms. We know that governments themselves are trying to come up with principles to guide the way in which data collected by these platforms might be used in the age of AI. There's talk of new institutions, and a very interesting one that the Open Data Institute's leading is the idea of data trusts. These are new forms of legal entity which hold data in almost a process of trusteeship or stewardship for a particular defined purpose. That there are rights and duties over the student data, that there's decision making about how that data will be used, and that one tries to mutualize more widely the actual uh, data asset itself. There are considerations around the platforms themselves about more effective data exchange. And this uh, particularly interesting project, I think, from, um, uh, from the large platforms, the uh, data transfer project, where at least they're attempting to get to grips with the fact that if you want, as a consumer or a user of any of these services, to move your data frictionlessly around, there needs to be standards and methods to do that. And there are also um, programs of work, uh, I, uh, a number of us helped uh, uh, lead the My Data program in the UK, which was trying to rebalance the interest that the individual has in the data that's being collected on their behalf. And I talked earlier on at the beginning of this presentation about the architectures that can assist us uh, getting uh, an insight into the actual data ecosystem itself. And beyond that, doing more. For example, can we exert control as individuals with these supercomputers in our pockets? Are we able to track, uh, to actually understand what the tracking is, to have some agency there? Uh, one of my uh, DPhil students, Conrad uh, Kolnig at the moment, has built a proof of concept, an Android system, using the insights from our uh, X-ray work to allow the system to effectively use a VPN to um, intercept and block tracking on the particular device. So you, app by app, you can actually see what trackers are being appealed to and variously uh, block them, or indeed put requests into regulators to find out whether the uh, data is being used in a particular way. Under the GDPR regulation in Europe, you can actually ask the the uh, the provider of the service uh, to uh, to to have uh, that information uh, uh, managed in particular ways or indeed removed. So putting agency on top of the technology, 
The other thing that is a response that we're beginning to see is the whole notion that rather than a platform-centric centralized web, what if the web was essentially re-decentralized? If the individual had more agency over their data by actually maintaining their own data stores. Um, and this is work that uh, we'd looked into a number of years ago, and its current one of its current manifestations, of course, is the uh, work that um, uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee is now doing on the on the solid architecture, social linked data, which tries to imagine a re-architected um, um, arrangement where data is held in a variety of places potentially, but it could be held locally on one's own devices or one, uh, 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 one's own home PCs. So that view of the world starts to show us that there are opportunities for new sorts of equity, for new sorts of architecture, architectures that could have to do with technology, regulation, new institutions, and new ways of thinking about how data is managed, data at scale on the web. And finally, perhaps just to reflect on the challenges we're facing as AI is deployed ever more ubiquitously at scale, these promise huge opportunities for us as consumers and citizens. But the question is, what information is being collected, as I've said, and where's it going, and what agency do we have in that process? And as our IoT devices develop, perhaps smart toys with lots of AI power behind them develop, one of the things that we have thought and worried about, um, um, uh, certainly I have since uh, uh, with my colleague Kieran O'Hara since uh, uh, 2000 and um, Eight, uh, when we wrote the spy in the coffee machine was just how do we manage this this fundamental tension between the services we know we want the services we know are powerful for us and a sense of autonomy and agency so finally i'd like to just perhaps uh, uh, leave you with the thought that in an age of increasing amounts of data we do see slip ups, we do see mistakes. Famously, um, cases of platforms uh, not being careful about who they might share their data with, or serious data breaches where large amounts of information is, is, uh, is, is lost. Or there are issues where data is used and then um, often for very uh, um, understandable and plausible and you know, health-related issues entirely acceptably, you might think. Um, the work that has been done on diagnosing diseases from the uh, retinal scans that are now routinely taken. Again, that, skin cancer, all of these issues raise not just questions about whose data is this, has it been permissioned, has the appropriate consent been given, but do we understand Another form of equity, which is, does the data represent a fair sample of the decision making that you want to apply to it? And Caroline Criado Paris's book on Invisible Women or Kathy O'Neill's book bring into very direct, stark uh, reality the question of biases in the data that is being liberated all the time. And this is a material question we have to face as we build these ever larger data architectures, are they equitable? Are they fair? Are they respecting our reasonable expectations around privacy, around how decisions are being taken? And this really does have material uh, impacts on us. And it's incumbent on us as researchers to ask questions about the proportionality and the effects, the values that we have standing behind our technology. And most recently, of course, this extremely interesting tension between the data we might need to effectively trace and contact people who have been affected by the pandemic and the interests around personal data 
protection, personal identification. And what is the trade-off in a moment of a public health emergency? We recognize that in some cases, at certain times, in certain situations, we relax our presumptions and assumptions, and we may come to a very different view about what is permissible to be done with our data. The question is, then how do we roll back to uh, other settings, to other defaults, as and when these emergencies uh, are dealt with. And a final point to make, behind all of this, it seems to me, sits the questions of ethics, the question of values. And one of the guiding um, thinkers, of course, around all moral philosophy, in certainly in the Western tradition, was, was Immanuel Kant. He was a, an 18th century German philosopher who had this wonderful uh, concept called the categorical imperative, which simply says, we shouldn't be treated as means, we are all and individually ends in ourselves. And it's a reason why I think we've seen increasing amounts of interest in the question of the values of the web, the values of the data in it, the values and purposes for which algorithms are being put. So when we talk about architectures for autonomy, I'd like us to think about the data itself, the data on which all of this is based, its origination, its ultimate destination, its purposes, its ability to be reused, its ability to be, in a certain sense, used for public as well as private good. And uh, on a final note, I'd like to just uh, raise a flag for the initiative that will be uh, that we're launching here in Oxford, which is the um, uh, Institute for Ethics and AI. There are many ethical um, uh, um, uh, initiatives around the AI uh, arena at the moment. A distinctive for this effort here in Oxford is that it's going to be led out of the uh, Faculty of Philosophy. It's going to be essentially seeking to put AI ethics into the same kind of central location that medical ethics occupies, where real advances in medicine required serious ethical analysis before we could get equitable and reasonable outcomes. And I think on that, I would like to uh, draw my talk to a close and welcome any questions there might be. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nigel. That was a, uh, an amazing talk, actually. Um, uh, we're currently inviting people actually to uh, to uh, come up with questions. Ben. And while we're doing this, I maybe I can start off by asking the following question. One thing that I believe you have very clearly illustrated is the big difference between using the semantics of data versus what machines can automatically learn today without knowing anything about those semantics. Um, how do you perceive this, this, as at least from my perspective, a fundamental difference for our future understanding of the role of data? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting to, to reflect on this tension between um, apparently uh, semantically focused and directed uh, methods and those which seem to be almost agnostic or in a, in a sense, uh, have no explicit semantic um, uh, um, characterization. I think in truth, when you look at many systems um, at scale, that they, they, they often are um, hybridizations, that in some sense that the, the, the organization that you find around um, large scale electronic thesauri, the organization you find around taxonomic efforts, that there's often a, um, a real complementarity between the um, uh, non-semantic approaches and semantic methods. Uh, and indeed, in some of the work around knowledge panels and knowledge graphs that you see in many of the work around um, drug discovery, there are explicit conceptual models of the meanings of um, the universe of discourse, as well as these very powerful pattern um, uh, detectors. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we got, a, I think, a very interesting question from Daniel uh, Swabe. So um, let me just uh, quote him. How do you envision values being explicit, explicit, 
<laughs> sorry about that, <laughs> being made explicit in the data, um, being collected and used by applications. So it's really the, yeah. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I mean, I think the, we, we often, uh, of course, would wish that our data was more richly annotated with a whole range of other metadata, you know, the, 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 the issues of quality, its characteristics. The issue of whether you can annotate it in some sense with, 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 with anything that comes close to um, embodying the value or purpose would be, would be perhaps one way to think about that. I think more generally one's looking for um, um, structures perhaps outside the uh, formal engineering to, to kind of sustain and maintain that the values are in some sense being adhered to. But I think in some cases you can imagine that um, uh, the uh, actual characterization of, of reasonable use or conditions of use uh, we, we're kind of aware of that notion when we think about machine readable terms of use. Maybe there are ways of beginning to think about um, the context of deployment and employment, which would capture some of those values. Um, and there has been a tradition of, um, of policy-based reasoning in AI in the past, but I do think that it would be uh, also need to be uh, supported by a, a range of other institutional arrangements where the values were in some sense being traded off in the decisions made about how the algorithm was deployed or how the data was collected in the first place. Okay, perhaps related to this, and also I think another question that, that Daniel actually also raised is the, is the following. Uh, you just mentioned the role of uh, ethics in uh, with respect to data. Now, um, my own experience is that um, uh, experts in ethics have do not necessarily have an engineering view. They, they observe the world, they have great analysis, and then they often also have some hindrance to actually join the pool of engineers in then making, for example, data um, ethically aware or uh, whatever name you would want to give us. So how do you see that we can draw people who know a lot about ethics into this world of engineering data, as so you, you, so you well described before. Data cannot take care of itself, so we need the ethics folks to help us engineer the data, I would say. That's an interesting point. I, I think the, uh, the investment you'll need from a number of perspectives to, to, to come up with, with high quality, curated, balanced, reasonable data will require, as you say, a, a range of uh, perspectives. The, the, the data engineering is often felt to be quite mundane, quite prosaic. It's often the thing that isn't given enough tension. I often feel that's, that's one of the problems we often uh, encounter uh, in trying to build these data architectures. There just simply isn't a recognition that we, we understand in a built infrastructure that there needs to be an investment of time and effort and material and, and, and multiple kind of uh, skills and disciplines. But in, uh, in the case of data, it's this intangible. It, it, it's often felt that maybe you could use it almost as exhaust data, where it, which, is, which is often not the case. I think the, the bringing the, um, the, 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 the ethical perspective into this is we try and work out how we're going to teach these new actual courses which are starting to evolve as well, where you're trying to sit down with, 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 with uh, students of law, students of, of, of ethics and students of computer science and try and find the common ground and, and, and make people aware of where the, uh, of where the uh, balance of interest needs to sit and what they've got to offer. And again, it's interesting to take the example from medical ethics. I think this is where you can, you can you, there are some really interesting analogies. Um, often when um, um, medical ethicists are, 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 are required, it is in really difficult edge cases. It's, it's in situations where there is, there is an at the limit kind of challenge, uh, but often it's on much more prosaic stuff. So like the notion of, of resource allocation, um, if you have a scarce resource, what are the reasonable kind of grounds upon which it's made available to people on what basis? And we're living that right now, of course, in the COVID crisis where people are making these extraordinarily difficult decisions around um, allocation resources to individuals. And, and I think that's where um, at least a well-developed framework that helps guide people um, through the process, um, if it's 
is, is the thing that, in a certain sense, uh, the, the, the ethical um, analysis, it gives you some hope of, of dealing reasonably and in an agile way with these situations. And so I think that's, uh, that's what we're beginning to see in the discussions around fair ML, I think, in fair machine learning, I think, is that kind of notion that uh, what is it to be best efforts to be a reasonable, unbiased uh, data set for purpose X, Y, and Z? Okay, then, then perhaps a, a, a final question um, to wrap up, and this is more from my <laughs> from my own engineering background. I'm much more into, uh, let's say, the data processing and the and the, the computer systems. Um, basically, two related things: how can we ever manage to process all the data that is there, and how do we know that we're processing the right data? Well, uh, in truth, can we? I mean, there is such a tsunami. I mean, one of the challenges are that there's almost a, um, uh, you get this learned helplessness situation, which is that uh, in the face of such a torrent, um, where do you find the signal in the noise? Where do you find the value and quality data in what's being emitted? Um, uh, can you not hide all sorts of kinds of uh, um, 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 not so desirable behavior in, in, in the torrents of data itself? Of course, that <laughs> literally is a method, uh, a set of methods, of course, in, in, in steganographic terms, you know, hiding the data in plain sight. Uh, I think it's uh, I think I think it's absolutely ongoing question that we have to, whilst we recognize that these torrents of data, there is also um, much to be said for remembering that the best form of data compression is a theory. <laughs> and actually, one of the things we mustn't forget in this flood of data is that also we're looking for deeper forms of conceptual understanding in our domains as well, that actually um, we may be incredibly impressed by the behavior of many of these systems based on on large arrays of data they're presented with, but also um, we're also hoping to understand more systematically how domains work and how uh, principles can be applied. So I think um, back in the day, data engineers have always been um, also, um, I think, quite disciplined about thinking that there are always resources to be imagined, even when you think you've got more than you've ever had before. And you sometimes have to engage in a discipline of deciding what to keep, what to curate, to what level, what to discard. And I think that that will be um, an ongoing uh, uh, dialogue. I think there are a lot of disciplines that data engineering has developed over the years that are entirely still relevant to the current context. Okay, thank you very much. It has been a wonderful talk. I have no idea how I can ask the audience to give you a big <laughs> hand for this wonderful speech, actually. Well, I found it very, very inspiring and also extremely informative. And I hope that uh, people can take this as a starting point for their, like I said, their morning, night, or afternoon, or evening for today. Good. Uh, again, Nigel, many thanks. And uh, well, uh, take care. And I hope you will also enjoy other parts of this uh, conference. I I'm sure I will. And I wish you all the best of luck. It's been uh, great to be a part of it, even uh, uh, remotely. And uh, um, yeah, uh, take what you will from, from the presentation. Uh, it, it is just about holding on to the importance of values. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks.